this morning comes from Psalm 46, 8 through 10. Here begins the reading. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shield with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The word of the Lord. Brody, good job. Thank you, John. Let's pray. Father, we look to you now, and we ask that as you promised St. Peter and the rest, that you would continue to feed your lambs, feed your children, your church, through the Holy Word, Bless the Bible, we pray, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that it would be read appropriately about your kingdom and glory. Bless me with the Holy Spirit gift of preaching, and bless your church to be a people who perceive the word of God and who hunger for it, who rejoice at righteousness and truth. And we pray in the name of Jesus that the word of Christ would dwell in us richly and produce a harvest of righteousness for your kingdom. We ask this all, Father, under the power and mercy of the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, this Sunday is obviously uh, the closest one to the 4th of July, and you, as a pastor, you have to, if it falls on a Wednesday, you have to say, now, is next Sunday going to be the 4th of July Sunday, or is this one? And clearly, this is it. And the 4th of July is, uh, just as a, as a person, as a, as a dad and a and a guy, the 4th of July is one of my favorite holidays. Uh, I love the summer. I love to go boating, barbecuing. So I have a kind of a, a hop in my step today, and I love all the red, white, and blue. But with all that said, my job as your pastor is to not preach the gospel of the United States of America, but to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so with a love for this nation, this morning... I'm called to lead us through looking through three different texts and three different angles of how God works in and through nations, what it means to have a country actually be blessed by God, and what we're called to do as ultimately citizens of God's holy kingdom, which will have no other kingdom rival, rivaling it. And this morning, I want to draw our attention to something we have in our sanctuary present with us every Sunday. To my right, to your left, is the American flag. The American flag is in the sanctuary of God Almighty, not because we worship the flag, and it's also inappropriate, I believe, to take it out of the sanctuary. It is a reminder that our mission field, where the Christ, Christ Church for us is called, to this country. For us to always have an eye on the field where we're called to go harvest, to always know the context to which we're called to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ's holy church, whether in this country or in China, North Korea, may we always be awake and mindful of the nation that hosts us. May we be excited. May we take advantage of all the blessings, in this case, the mountains of blessings. If we don't like the United States of America, try to succeed anywhere else in this, in this world. Amen. But at the same time, to not be wooed, sedated, hypnotized by the fruit of this land so that we no longer can speak a word of Christ to her. You see. That's the beauty of being in Christ and being in a fruitful land. So today we look at three different sides of what it means to be in God and God's relationship to the nations that he has established. And the first thing I'd like us to, uh, to consider, there's a, a word from Acts chapter 17, beginning with verse 24, and St. Paul says something very interesting. The first thing he says is, the God who made the whole world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. 
And he determined the times set forth for them and the exact places where these nations would live. God did this so that mankind would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and we move and we have our being. The first thing we see in Acts chapter 17 from Scripture is that God made every nation. He wants every nation. He loves every nation. He's called for these things to happen, even the nations we don't agree with. He's got this really cool plan, apparently. He says, I've called for a certain cultural idea of people diverse upon this land, upon this earth, to be spread out It happened with Babylon and Egypt and Assyria, the Phoenicians. If you go back through ancient history, 10,000 years now of human race operating with nations. And even to this day, nations are sprinkled upon every plate tectonic that God's had on earth from Africa and all the nations in Asia and the Americas. And God says, why did I do this? Why not only would I say, I want Paula to live today and not a hundred years ago, but I want her to live in this nation, in this geographical location, with this nation speaking this language, English. Why would he do that? Scripture says God did this so that mankind would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Well, I didn't know this until I was reading the Bible this week, that God has a purpose for the nations. Why would he call for such diversity? Why would he allow for borders? Why would he allow and have wars go on? Why would he allow for rivalries and different people groups gathering up? Why aren't we one big happy family living in one big nation that knows no border? Well, Scripture says there's something about the human race, there's something about our design in Christ that says that we, are, we will most likely come into contact with the Father in a condition conducive for who you are. He said he spread all these nations across the planet. He let people live in them. And by living where they live as they live, the scriptures in Greek says that people would reach out and rub their hand across the holiness of God. That people in North Korea somehow by the mystery and revival nature of the gospel, would reach out in their setting and touch God. We happen to live in a country that has experienced this. Historians call it the first great awakening or the second great awakening, which our congregation is a product of, the Stone Campbell movement. The United States of America has been a friendly country to revivals. People argue whether we're a Christian nation or not. I think that's missing the point. What we should say is that God has allowed His presence to be felt in this country over and over and over again. He's given us the Gospel. He's given us the Bible and the native language that we speak. He's given us church buildings and preachers. This is the land of Billy Graham. This is the land where John Wesley came out and left his ministry from England in this massive movement called the United Methodist Church. Where's my Methodist? The Methodist Church sprung across this nation. Where's my Baptist? The Baptist Church, whoa, took off from near the Mississippi in Kentucky, just kept traveling further and further west. And then the Church of Christ. Yeah. Church of Christ. I love having Church of Christ in the house. They know how to sing. This has been a land of revival. This has been a land of fruitfulness. This has been a land where people have encountered God. But it's not the only land. God has a plan for North Korea. God has a plan for Tehran, Iran. God has a purpose. He has a plan for all nations. And He's using them now as He chooses in His timing so that individuals could touch Him. 
And in His mercy, according to Acts 17, He's the one that saw this, determined this. This was His solution. I'm going to allow for these things to take place. So if you're one of these people that says, why do we always have to live in countries? Why do we have to build walls? Why do we have to have borders and boundaries and fight wars? Consider, if you will, those are a lesser symptom and problem of something that has allowed such good. God has used these nations, it says, so that men would reach out and touch him, and behold, we have. And behold, it's still happening if we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ as the most potent revivalistic insert into this world we need to be praying for revival in North Korea we need to be praying for revival in China which there is now we need to be praying for God's love and mercy his personal presence not a sermon from Paul a presence of God to make its way evident and felt in these nations that's what he says that's why they had, this is the purpose of nations, is so that we can touch God. That's number one. The purpose of the nations is built around people to be able to have in their real time, in their real life, an encounter with the Lord in such a way that their hearts transform, they become a believer in Jesus Christ, and now they're marked forever prepared for the eternal kingdom, which knows no end. The second thing that we'll wanted to say this morning is found in Psalm chapter 2 and while God created every nation Psalm 2 points out the fact points out this weird relationship we have with God that at the same time God is for nations and against nations it's similar for me to say God loves you but he hates your sin that's for nations and against nations Psalm chapter 2 beginning with verse 1 says why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord Yahweh and against His anointed one, Christ. They say of God, let us break God's chains and throw off their fetters. But God enthroned in heaven laughs and the Lord scorns and scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my own king on Zion, my holy hill. God created every nation. God's allowed for every nation. And at the same time, he's striving with and against every nation. And friends, there have been times he's had to strive against our nation. We are not a righteous nation we need Jesus. And a nation that's righteous, which is the only ultimate righteous nation, is going to be the kingdom of God. There's a few markers about what a righteous nation would look like, and one of them is how we treat the most vulnerable in the land. How we treat the old people. How we treat those who can't produce for the good of other people, who just need mercy. A righteous land, a land that God's got His hand on, that He's not striving with as much as He's blessing. It's a land that's filled so much with submission to His Word, breakthroughs with the Holy Spirit, people loving like they've never loved before, forgiving like they've never forgive, forgive before, united in something bigger than themselves. And my friends, right now, given those two markers, is our country a blessed country by God right now, or is it more clearly a, a nation that God's having to strive with for his kingdom to come about. Should we even have the word united in the United States of America anymore? You been on Facebook lately? That's fun. You drop a spoon and somebody freaks out. You say any word, there's... there's a blessed family, a blessed church, a blessed nation gives each other the benefit of the doubt. They're not looking for something to be offensive about and write a mean letter to. They're saying, oh, I love, I love him or her. I know, that, I know what they meant to say. But what do we do? We get our pitchforks and our torches and we find other people who are like us and we go attack that person. God looks at every nation, including ours. And he's got at the same time this 
fatherly love. He's going to use this nation no matter what for his glory, but there's parts of us that he has to strive against. There's things in us that he, he, he does not love about. He, there's things that are just so opposed to what he's naturally trying to grow in this country. So number one we see in Acts chapter 17 is that God has willed for these things to take place, for these nations to be formed. These are good things. They're God's things. He uses them. Number two, God's relationship to these nations are both fatherly love and contentious. And the nation we serve, we love, we're born into, we pray for, we seek revival in, we've seen revival in, we need to be mindful that God doesn't need us, we need Him. We need Him. His kingdom's going to come, period. Which leads me to my third, Psalm 33. Beginning with verse 12. Blessed is the nation. What's the song we always sing? God. Okay, so I'm going to, like, here's what you've been praying for. I'm going to let you know. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Father. Old Testament Yahweh. The people he chooses for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and he sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He forms the hearts of all who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all this great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love to deliver them from death and to keep them alive in famine. Have you ever prayed for something you didn't really want? God, give me patience. God, keep me humble. (laughs) An American to pray for God to bless America is touching on that kind of prayer, and I'll tell you why. God only blesses things he controls. Last week we talked Isaiah or Psalm 86. You're praying for a blessing, a breakthrough. The bigger question is when you've punched through that problem to the other side, you can see what your life's going to be like when you're delivered from this illness or from this debt or from this problem. God has a right to ask you, now how's that going to help you be submissive to me? How's that going to help you walk with my son Jesus Christ better? How's that going to help you love like I love and forgive like I forgive? How's that going to help you? God is asking the same question of our nation. You want me to bless you? But you don't want me to own you? We think this is a one night stand? I'm going to give you amber fields of grain and Purple Mountains, majesty, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you salvation and money and good crops and peace and, and you, don't, you won't fear me? You won't tremble at my word? Be careful. To ask for God's blessing is to ask for His sovereign control over our lives. To get baptized into Christ is for you to say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ in me. May God bless the United States of America, and may we know that what we're saying is may God's glorious Word of Christ reign in the hearts of the average citizen so that we don't act like we act, we don't think like we think, We start living in ways that are appealing to God, that are His ways. We're generous. We're slow to shed blood. I don't want to get on big political issues, but some of those are touching on this point. I mean, we have to say, what does God think about X 
Y, Z. What does the Bible teach about this? What does the whole counsel of God say on the things that we argue about on Facebook? Because I'm telling you, our nation is not, as we stand, a nation who fears the Lord. The United States of America is not one burning with reverence for God. The average citizen, you don't have to go to Portland, Oregon, or Austin, Texas. The average citizen in Dallas, Texas, even in Lubbock, Texas, you'll find them. Isn't what Scripture talks about. And so my friends, in this season, we're on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. We're at the moment, God's already had three shifts, here's the fourth, hopefully the last, until the return of Christ. We are entering a season, this October 31st, since 1517, that's 500 years later, we are at the cusp of a massive tectonic plate shifting where God's going to do big stuff. We're going to watch Him do it and testify, but God's going to do big things. And may we be ready to pray for this nation like we should. Not to use our pride in this nation to hate other nations, but to ask that the gospel would be so evident that people would rub their hand across the Lord and they can see their heart. That people would come into contact with God and their lives are changed. This is what it means to bless America. This is what it means for God's favor to roll into this land. May this country experience why God allowed this country to be in the first place. And may Christ's church be faithful to the one who reveals himself when he chooses. May our only hope be in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is already active under this country's feet. May we as a church pray for God to bless this country, but to bless it like God blesses it. This is a good thing that we pray for those whom we serve, that we love this land. But may God's kingdom be the greatest thing we hope for. In a few moments, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song that's been kind of the hymn of this country, but more importantly, it's about the hymn of a great kingdom which Christ is bringing. It's unstoppable. You're not that powerful to make it happen or not. No superstition can make it hurry or slow down. But as we rise and we sing the battle hymn of the Republic, may we sing it toward God asking for His kingdom to come in this country. Let's rise.